DNA is the only molecule that has the ability to reproduce itself. Reproducing itself is also known as replication. Replication of DNA is very important as it carries all our genetic information that is used in our bodies and passed on from generation to generation. Here we'll look at a simplified version of how replication is carried out. We'll start by looking at this diagram of a double helix structure of DNA. The two orange coils represent the phosphate sugar backbones of the two DNA strands that are interwound. And the colored bars in the center represent the complementary base pairs, which are held together by hydrogen bonds. Before DNA can be replicated, it requires an enzyme to uncoil the strands and break the hydrogen bonds holding the strands together. The enzyme is called helicase. Here we'll represent it as a simple wedge-shaped object. However, like all enzymes, its actual structure is very complex. The helicase unwinds the coil and breaks the hydrogen bonds between the bases. Now if a double helix or coil unwinds in one place, then it would try to wind up more tightly in a different place. In order to prevent the coil from winding too tightly in some places, an enzyme called topoisomerase notches or nicks the coil, lets it unwind enough to release the extra tension, then joins the coil together again. This allows the double helix to keep on uncoiling easily as the helicase works its way into it, without coiling too tightly somewhere else. If you would like to learn more about topoisomerase, look it up on the internet. It's quite a fascinating enzyme. The process is much easier to illustrate if we think of the two strands as being uncoiled to begin with. Remember, this is only a simplified model. It's also easier to show if we pull back the yellow ribbons around the sugar phosphate backbones. However, the backbones are still present. As the helicase moves into the double strand, it breaks the hydrogen bonds holding it together and separates the two strands. The helicase continues to unzip the two strands from one another as it breaks the hydrogen bonds between them. It continues to move in and separate the two strands from one another. We'll stop here, but we realize that the enzyme will continue to uncoil the double helix and break the two strands apart. What is formed here is called a replication fork. The single strands are like two prongs of a fork. Even though the base pairs from each strand have been separated, there are still attractive forces between them. Adenine attracts thymine, and cytosine attracts guanine. So we might ask ourselves, why don't the two strands move back together right away? It turns out that molecules called single-strand binding proteins bind themselves to the strands and hold them in place so they don't move back together. They are proteins that bind to the now single strands, hence the name single-strand binding proteins. Like all protein molecules, their shape is very complex. We depicted them here as simple circular objects. This is all taking place within the cell nucleus. It turns out that in the nucleus, there are free nucleotides circulating around. The bases on these free nucleotides are attracted to their complementary bases on the exposed single strands. Therefore, they can move close to a strand and pair up. We'll look at the nucleotide with adenine on the top left of the diagram. It moves in and pairs up with an exposed thymine on the top strand. Wrapped around the strand is an enzyme called DNA polymerase. Its actual structure is very complex, but we'll represent it here as a simple rectangle. The DNA polymerase binds the new nucleotide to the existing strand, and hydrogen bonds form between the adenine and thymine bases. At this point, we'll have a look at the top single strand. The nucleotide on the left end has a 3' carbon here. If you can't remember why this is a 3' carbon, you may need to review the structure of DNA and the deoxyribose sugar in it. So we'll call this the 3' end of the strand. Now let's have a look at the nucleotide on the right side of this part of the strand that has been exposed. And we'll look at this carbon atom here, the carbon atom on the deoxyribose sugar which is outside of the ring. This is called a 5' carbon atom. 
and this is called the 5' prime end of the exposed part of this strand. It's important to be aware that nucleotides attach to the original strand from its 3' prime end toward its 5' prime end. So the next nucleotide we'll consider is this one with guanine. It will move toward cytosine on the top strand. And the DNA polymerase binds it to the growing chain. The next exposed base on the top is guanine. And a nucleotide with cytosine moves toward the guanine, like this. And the DNA polymerase bonds it to the new strand. Now a nucleotide with thymine moves in, and the DNA polymerase bonds it to the new strand. Now one with guanine moves in and pairs up with cytosine, and it's bonded to the new strand. The process continues to the right on the top strand, until more of the new nucleotides are added to the new strand by the DNA polymerase. And a new section of a strand of DNA has been formed. Now notice this section of the lower original strand. Its bases from left to right are A, G, C, T, G, G, A, C, and A. Now we'll compare the new strand on top with the old strand on the bottom. The order of bases in the new section on top is exactly the same as the order in the old section at the bottom. The new strand is an exact copy of the old strand. Now we'll concentrate on the bottom strand. Here's the 5' prime carbon of the sugar on the left end of this strand. So this is called the 5' prime end of this strand. And here's the 3' prime carbon atom in the sugar in the right end of this section of the strand. So this is the 3' prime end of this section. Recall that when nucleotides are added to an exposed section of a strand, they add from the 3' prime end to the 5' prime end of the original strand. We'll show a number of free nucleotides and a molecule of DNA polymerase. We can take this nucleotide with thymine and move it to the adenine. And the DNA polymerase bonds it to the original strand. Because we work from right to left on this strand, the next nucleotide we'll add is this one with guanine, and we'll move it to the cytosine. And the DNA polymerase attaches it. After adding more nucleotides with complementary bases to this original bottom strand from its 3' prime end toward its 5' prime end, we end up with this new section. Due to reasons a more detailed description of this process will reveal in more advanced biology courses, breaks occur between some of the nucleotides in the new strand that forms here. This is where yet another enzyme called DNA ligase comes into the process. Like all enzymes, its structure is very complex, so we'll represent it here as a simple green oval. It moves down to the new strand on the bottom and moves across it, repairing the breaks. We'll temporarily fade out this new strand on the top. To see that this newly formed section of a strand on the bottom is an identical copy of the old strand on the top. If you check, you'll see the bases are in exactly the same order. So these new sections we made in the center are exact copies of the sections of the original DNA. The helicase will continue to unwind the double helix on the right, exposing more bases so the new strands will continue to grow in length. The old and new sections will form two new double strands. And these new double strands will eventually coil up and form two new double helices. Here's another diagram illustrating DNA replication. At the top is the original DNA helix, and at the bottom are the new DNA helices. We'll take a very simplified view of this process. These bars represent the two strands of the original double-stranded DNA molecule. When DNA is replicated, each original strand forms one of the strands of each copy and the new strands form the second strand of each copy. 
So each new DNA molecule is half old and half new. This is what is known as semi-conservative replication. The strands of the original DNA are conserved or kept as they form half of each new DNA molecule. The actual process of DNA replication is much more complex than what we presented in this video, but this should give you some idea of how it works. In more advanced biology courses, you'll learn the process in much greater detail.